right, so let's 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 get started. Um, let me remind you of the uh, important business announcement, which is Are you at Bill's house? <laughs> I believe his parents won't be there. <laughs> simple game, but there are lots of ways it can be generalized to make it more interesting. 
Uh, the stakes might not be equal probable. That's one of the first things we think about. Uh, unless you you're, want to load everything up with symmetry, because uh, which is Lewis wanted to do, because he wanted everything to be conventional. So he wanted the setting to be as symmetric as possible. So there couldn't be anything that gave him a hint that one convention is better than the other. Uh, but in lots of signaling games, states are equally probable. There could be uh, more state signals and acts. So the first generalization is n states, n signals, and acts. There's no reason why the number of state signals and acts should match one another. Right? Um, so the second generalization is different numbers of state signals and acts. Um, we could relax the common interest to have different kinds of payoff functions. Uh, 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 costly signaling is just one way of doing this, right? If, if you do costly signaling, that just means that you would add something to the payoff function um, and then analyze it as a signaling game. Um, and uh, uh, finally, you might say, well, we want not just one sender and one receiver, but lots of senders and lots of receivers that can be strung together in some sort of a network, and the signals can then interact over the network. So those are, those are all interesting generalizations. And uh, I'll talk about uh, some of them. So we're moving right along here. Uh, part two is equilibrium consideration. So we're talking about equilibrium selection. So we need to survey equilibria in these games. And here's uh, a picture of, uh, blown up a little bit so that you see pixels of John Maynard Smith in his garden. Uh, I'll be interested uh, at least in one strand of this uh, in evolutionary considerations. So um, uh, Maynard Smith introduced the notion of an evolutionarily stable strategy, uh, uh, which is a strategy such that the whole population does it. Uh, any mutant would do strictly worse. Any epsilon mutant would do strictly worse than the, the uh, population than the natives. Uh, and this is generalized to an evolutionarily stable state, right, which uh, applies to mixed states. And you can think of this as uh, strategy a little different from the population proportions uh, as, the, as the test case. Okay, so there's there's one uh, way to try to select among equilibria by uh, looking at equilibria that have special properties. Not all equilibria are evolutionarily stable. Uh, and I'll mostly talk about evolutionary stability. So let's start with the simplest Lewis signaling game two by two by two states probable um, pure common interest. Um, uh, there are two isolated signaling system equilibria, both one in which signal one means state one, signal two means state two, and the other that you get by producing the signals. Right? Um, and they're both evolutionarily stable strategies uh, in major Smith's sense. Um, and then there a bunch of other equilibria uh, called pooling equilibria in which no information at all is transmitted. Uh, and those are equilibria in which the sender ignores the state and the receiver ignores the signal. And what does ignores mean? Uh, ignores means the sender uh, sends the signals with probabilities that are independent of the state observed. Uh, and those could be anywhere between zero. Um, and likewise, the receiver uh, chooses the acts with some fixed probabilities that are independent of the signal received, and those can go between zero and one. So we have a whole square of um, pooling equilibria in the simplest game. Um, and uh, none of these is in BSS, of course, uh, can't be. Um, Square itself is not an evolutionarily stable set, general of things, and so on. So equilibrium selection seems to select out the uh, signal system. Um, what happens if the states are the equal problem? Um, we still have two isolated signaling system equilibria, the one same ones as before. Um, we 
have no longer a square of pooling equilibria um, because now if the receiver isn't getting any information from the sender, the best thing for the receiver to do is to do the act that pays off in the most probable state. So the square collapses to a line of pooling equilibria. Um, and as before, none of those are evolutionarily stable, and the line as a whole is an evolutionarily stable set, so we seem to have some nice equilibrium selection going here using the two spin. Um, if we move to n states, n signals, and n acts, um, then we can get uh, all of the foregoing phenomena that, uh, that you got uh, in the two by two by two case, uh, plus uh, connected components of various kinds of partial pooling equilibria. Now, partial pooling equilibria are when uh, the sender lumps some states together, right? um, but not all of them. If you lump them all together, that's pooling. Right? Um, so the uh, simplest case might be uh, in state three, send signal three, so you get signal three, you do act three, but the sender and receiver pool um, uh, as before right? uh, on, the, on the other two states. So again, um, only the signaling systems are evolutionarily stable. None of the partial pooling or total pooling stables are evolutionarily stable. Um, now I'm moving along to a little more generalization where there's a mismatch between the number of states, signals, and acts. Um, and here we have uh, an extra signal. Right? We only need two, really, to get efficient information transfer. But we've got three. Okay. Uh, so now there are lots of ways to get perfect information transfer between the sender and the receiver. One way would be for all the signals to remain in play and for two of them to be synonyms, right? So in one state, the sender sometimes sends one of them, sometimes the other. The receiver recognizes both of those as telling him that's the state that does the right act for that state, right? Um, or it could be that you have unused signals. That is, uh, the sender sends one signal for state one, another for state two, and never sends the third signal. And the receiver, um, if he gets the first signal, does the right thing for state one. If he had, does the second signal, gets the right thing for state two. And if he gets the third signal, then he's got some probability of doing the right thing for state one and the right thing for state two. And it could be anything, right? So it could be anything than zero or one. Uh, and it doesn't make any difference because it's never exercised. Um, So here's a diagram of synonyms case. Um, my columns are states, signals, and acts. Uh, and my arrows are telling you what the strategies are of the central receiver or distance. Um, so here's synonyms. Uh, in state one, the sender sends signal one with probability x, signal two with probability one minus x. X can be anything from zero to one. So here we have a whole line of equilibria that are synonym equilibria. Uh, and then the receiver does the right thing on either of these two, and then the, the rest just works uh, uh, deterministically. Uh, and here is the case of unused signals. Um, <coughs> Signal two is never sent, right? So the receiver uh, does the right thing to get signal one, the right thing to get signal three. Um, but if he gets signal two, he has some strategy that's never exercised, right? That is probability y does act one, probability one minus y he does act two. Um,
note that these two um, lines of equilibria share a point. Um, so that if x is 1, that means that I'm going from state 1 deterministically to signal 1. Um, if y is 0, um, that means, or if y is 1, that means I'm going deterministically from signal 2 to act 1. Right? So if those are both the case, I've got a point that's in both of these lines of equilibrium. The equilibrium structure of this game is very com complicated. There is a whole component of um, such efficient equilibria. All of them have perfect information transfer. And it's all connected. Right? You go from continuously all through these kinds of equilibria. Now, we also have, of course, the equilibrium. Um, Well, there, then there can't be any evolutionarily stable structures in this game. Right? Um, any of these efficient equilibria right, has guys that are right in the neighborhood that are equal to the um, So this is pointed out for the first time, I think, uh, by uh, Donaldson, Blackman, and Bergstrom in the Journal of Theoretical Biology in 2007, where they did uh, an analysis of the equilibrium structure of such games. And it's general, if you have too many, if you have a lot of signals, right? This is always true, there never are any evolutionary state structures. Okay. So things are getting more complicated, and Maynard Smith is not giving us an answer. Um, you could have many states, and uh, this may be uh, a more common uh, situation uh, especially in animal signaling, that is, there may be lots of states, uh, but not so many signals available right, for the signalers. Um, uh, and uh, uh, where you have uh, a lot of states, but some kind of a bottleneck that the state information gets funneled through, either because there aren't many acts available or because there aren't too many signals, uh, then you have a model of category that is, uh, the best you can have, the best equilibria are equilibria that lump some of the states together, put the states together in categories. Um, uh, in such games, um, there may or may not be evolutionary sample strategies. Okay, so I will go through the details. Sometimes you can bring it up, so there are, and sometimes there aren't. Um, Uh, and finally, um, my, my third generalization, or fourth, or whatever it was, uh, was to uh, go away from common interest. So I go all the way away from common interest and assume that the sender and receiver have opposed interests. Um, these are the payoffs for, respectively, sender and receiver for each of the state act combinations. Um, and then the only equilibria that are possible in this signal game are uh, pooling equilibria, that is equilibria with no information here. Okay. So you might say, uh, so there's no ESS, but there's also no equilibrium selection, or not much of an equilibrium selection. Uh, there's more than one there are no ESs. So, I'd like to suggest that the right way to think about equilibrium selection is not with uh, a static or quasi-dynamical concept like ESS or strict Nash or any of the hundred other equilibrium refinements that were put forward in the game theory literature when everybody was doing this, uh, but with dynamics. Um, and of course, the, the, the question is, what dynamics should you use? Um, 
and I don't have a particular dynamics that I think is the right dynamics for everything, but here are some specimen dynamics in which interesting things happen. Um, if you're wondering how you get equilibrium selection over evolutionary time uh, uh, in such uh, interactions that are modeled as these kinds of games, uh, then replicator dynamics is a reasonable choice. <laughs> something is, faster it grows. Right? Um, things that are more successful than, uh, than the uh, average of the population increase their population proportion. Things that are less successful decrease their population proportion. Uh, if you assume that the payoffs are in terms of Darwinian fitness and the population is very big, then what you expect is what you get and you get some differential equations. Uh, Replicator dynamics. Okay. And I could say more, but I won't say more unless you ask. Um, the other kind of dynamics uh, I'd like to talk about is learning dynamics. Uh, and this is where you have two individuals repeatedly interacting. Uh, and uh, they start out not knowing how to signal. Uh, and uh, there are these repeated interactions. Uh, and there's trial and error learning. Okay. Lots of other learnings are in, uh, learning dynamics are interesting, right? uh, but the one I'm going to talk about is trial and error learning dynamics. Uh, uh, so uh, this is this is a version of reinforcement learning um, that was brought to the game theory community by uh, Al Roth and Ido Arab uh, in a paper on low rationality learning in games, but they trace it back to Richard Bernstein. Uh, and uh, her, what Hernstein called this matching law. Of course, if you read Hernstein, the matching law actually means a lot of different things and so on. Uh, but, but this kind of reinforcement go, goes like this. There are, there are a bunch of things you choose between. Right? Um, you might start out choosing at random um, uh, according to some weights. So we'll assume that you have equal weights in choosing. Might say that you're choosing between three things and you've got an urn with a, a ball of color one, color two, or color three. You reach in here and pull out the ball that tells you what to choose. You choose something. Um, then you get a payoff. Right? The payoff could be zero, it could be something else. You take the number of marbles of the color of the thing that you chose equal to your payoff and you put it back in. So your urn keeps track of the accumulated payoffs. Right? And then next time you're reaching the urn, so you choose with probability proportional to the accumulated payoffs over history. Okay? That's, that's the plain vanilla version of raw data of dynamics. Uh, I should say something more. I'm, I'm, I'm especially interested in low rationality learning uh, to the extent that it works. Uh, because the lower rationality, the more interesting it is if it works. Um, so, whereas in, usually in the evolutionary dynamics in these singling games, you let a whole strategy evolve, right? Or if you have two populations, a sender population and a receiver population, the sender strategy and a receiver strategy, and those are the things that evolve. Uh, but in my learning model, uh, I don't. I don't want to uh, have the learners um, have strategy necessarily to start with, right? So they'll just have things that are stimuli, right? And they'll respond. So that means that the sender in the two-state case has two stimuli: state one and state two. He's got learned for each one. That determines the probability of sending signals. And the receiver's got two stimuli, those are the signals, and he's got an urn for each one. And they don't have to think about these things being connected at all, right? They just have reinforcement learning going. So uh, you could do reinforcement learning directly on the strategies, but I'm trying to move down to a little lower, uh, more primitive level and have it work uh, directly on the acts. So, 
section four is equilibrium selection by dynamics in both of these things. Um, and uh, perhaps surprisingly, uh, I, th I think it's surprising, um, in the simplest Lewis signaling game, um, both evolution and learning converge to a signaling system with probability one. Um, for evolution, that means um, let's have all of the possible population proportions. Right? Uh, put a uniform measure on them. Choose initial population proportions at random and run the replicator dynamics. Okay? For almost every point that you can choose, you converge to a signal system. Okay? And that, that is due to the fact that the um, pooling equilibrium component um, is unstable, right? And if you get perturbed off it in one direction, you go to one signaling system. If you get perturbed off it in the other direction, you get carried to the other signaling system. Okay. So signaling systems just pop up spontaneously in that sense. Um, and uh, that's shown, along with other things that I'll mention a little bit later, uh, in an article by uh, Josef Hoffbauer and Simon Hudiger in um, Journal of Theoretical Biology. That was the name. Um, it's also true in the reinforcement learning. Um, you start these guys off uh, choosing at random, uh, and uh, with probability one, they converge to a signaling system. Okay. Uh, if you choose them on, uh, set them off with equal number of balls for uh, for all their choices right, in all of their urns, say one for each, but it doesn't matter. Uh, then with probability half, they converge to one. Probability half, they converge to the other. Right? Uh, if you start them out with unequal numbers, um, uh, then with probability one, they'll converge to a signal system. Okay? And which one depends on how you start them off. Okay? So pretty strong result. This is this is in a, in a paper uh, with uh, three guys who collaborated in proving the theorem and, and being <laughs> suggested the problem. Suppose the states are in equal probable. So this is the smallest departure you can imagine, I think, from the simplest Lewis signal. Okay. Then it isn't true anymore. Replicator dynamics sometimes hits uh, an ESS, that is, a signaling system with perfect information transfer, but sometimes hits the pooling component. Um, there's an analytic treatment in uh, Hoffbauer and Hooker, and what happens is the, the component of pooling equilibria, right, this is a line segment now, um, is such that if you're near, if you're in the interior of the space, population proportions, and you're near this component, but not at the end points, you get sucked into it. Okay. If you're at the end points, you get pushed away. So, um, so the component in, in the language of dynamical systems is not an attractor because it doesn't attract everything close to it. Right? Um, and it's not an evolutionarily stable set. And you can think of all the refinement stuff that's been done in terms of evolutionary game theory or regular game theory to refine. right? And it isn't any of those things. right? But nevertheless, it attracts some proportion of the state space that has positive measure. Okay? And that positive measure gets bigger and bigger as the states become more and more unequal. Okay? So you make the states very, very unequal, uh, then it becomes quite likely that you get to no signal. Although, uh, although uh, if you don't make the zero one, the signaling systems always themselves have some positive measure. Um, 
reinforcement learning. Um, sometimes it's signaling systems, sometimes the cooling. Um, there, there is, we now have ended the analytic results for these things, uh, except for something more I'll, I'll get to about uh, replicator dynamics modified. Um, but uh, certainly nothing more for reinforcement learning. Uh, and there's no published analysis, even of this case, for reinforcement learning. So, though there's, there's something you can say that's analytic, but let's say uh, for, for public consumption, uh, this is simply, from now on, it's all a simulation. Unless I say something. Suppose we have n states um, with the states equal probable, so we have three, four, three or more states with the states equal probable. Uh, now we've got partial pooling equilibria. Okay? We're keeping the states equal probable to make it easy to learn how to signal. It's still true that you never get total pooling, right? Uh, but it's not true that you don't get partial pooling. Sometimes you get partial pooling. Um, this is a simulation result. There's some partial analysis uh, of uh, a part of the game where you look at the component of partial cooling equilibria in this uh, paper that I have with Bruce and Kevin Zoltman that just came out in some things where we can actually look at the surface and uh, compute the, the stability properties of the so Things get attracted into it. Um, with uh, reinforcement learning, no analytic treatment, but simulations now again show partial pooling. Um, never hitting a total, total pooling equilibrium as long as the states are improbable, but hitting, it'll, hitting partial pooling equilibrium. And now, if you do this instead of three state signals and X and go up you know, to nine, ten state signals and X, then you, then you have various partial pooling equilibrium, lots of the time. Now remember, these are cases in which ESS seemed to be very good for equilibrium selection because they gave us a difficult answer. But the answer is wrong. So that, that's the first. Um, in two states, three signals, two acts. Um, again, there's no analytic treatment. Uh, simulations show that synonyms persist. Okay, so you could think you could get either synonyms persisting in your final results, or you could get synonyms withering away and uh, unused signals. Uh, simulations suggest you never get unused signals. Synonyms always persist. Um, so ESS didn't tell you anything, but uh, dynamics is trying to tell you that synonyms is natural in this setup for synonyms to persist. Um, if there are lots of states, so that the states have to go through a few signals, um, then we have uh, dynamics of category formation. There's, there's, there's lots of interesting work on this now, I think. Uh, there's some uh, uh, papers by Jeff Barrett, the first one I think in 2007, in, in which he talks uh, in terms of rather simple fluid signaling games in terms of uh, category formation conventionality. Um, these, are, these are games in which you can get one set of categories or another set of categories. Um, Natalia Komarova, Kimberly Jamison, and Louis Nairns uh, have a series of paper on evolution of color categories uh, where they have an evolutionary dynamics and uh, uh, what's driving the evolution is the confusability of, of colors so that you, you, you get filtered through a bottleneck, right? And you have only so many things that'll go through this bottleneck. 
Uh, but but you want the, the categories to be separated in nice way. So there's a topology on the states, right? And that influences the kind of categories that you can. Um, I think the first one is in uh, Journal of Theoretical Biology. Um, and then there's a paper that I just saw recently. It's not published yet, uh, uh, but it's, it's on the web uh, by Jaeger, uh, Metzner, and uh, Riedel um, on, on what they call Bournoy languages. Uh, and they, uh, they, put, uh, they put their state space on a plane or something like that. Uh, and uh, they have uh, a kind of similarity metric that's, that's the metric on the plane. Uh, and things get uh, filtered through a small number of signals. And, and something like uh, Komarova, uh, Jameson, and Aarons, they, they get natural kinds of partitions uh, emerging on the plane. Uh, and act actually, these turn out to be more like desolations. So uh, I, I think it's a rich area, uh, and uh, just a few things have been done, and probably a lot more things have been done. Um, okay, I want to go back to the game where I relax the common interest. Um, so uh, uh, here, the only uh, equilibrium uh, that was possible would be an equilibrium with no information transfer, because send their transfer of any information, right? and the receiver wants to move them, and the sender wants to change the information, and so on. So you have a kind of uh, arms race. Uh, the, the sender would like to deceive the receiver uh, as to the state. Right? Um, if we, for the sake of an example, restrict the strategies of the sender and the receiver here, um, to separating strategies with two signals. So the sender doesn't ignore the state. The sender sends something deterministically, and uh, the receiver does something deterministically. But now we look at a whole pop population of such senders and receivers. So there are different proportions of the population that have these deterministic strategies. You look how the population evolves. Um, well, there's a unique equilibrium, population equilibrium now, at a half a half. Right? Um, but this is just like matching pennies uh, in evolutionary dynamics. If you start anywhere else, you don't get there. Right? You go around and around. Um, so, so given the strategies restricted in the way that I did, there's no equilibrium selection problem left because there's only one equilibrium. Uh, but that doesn't make any difference because you never get it. So equilibrium selection is actually the long question. The question is, what happens? Uh, well, this is kind of a rigged up example. Right? Uh, so is it good for anything? Really, I have a couple of examples. Um, Elliot Wagner, uh, who's writing a dissertation right now, uh, has a working paper uh, at the Institute for Mathematical Behavioral Sciences at UC Irvine, um, where he analyzes uh, Spence's model of job market signaling. Uh, and, and the model has to be cut down a little bit in, in order to be able to be something that can be analyzed. Uh, but um, uh, here's the sort of thing he finds. Um, for certain parameter values, you have a lot of the interior being attracted to a face. Uh, and on the face, you get things just like magic pens. Um, so if you look just at the equilibrium structure, right, there are some equilibria. Right? Uh, uh, the good job market signaling equilibrium, right, which in which the costs in force on a signal is, is a point attractor, right? But it isn't that it attracts the whole space or even most of the space, right? Most of it gets attracted to other stuff. And a significant, a significant portion gets attracted to cycles. Uh, 
Um, so, drug market signaling is a famous model right, in economics, Nobel Prize. Um, uh, there's a, a famous model of costly signaling in evolutionary biology called the Sir Philip Sidney game. Right? This is a model of chick begging for food. Right? Parents, parents want to feed their chick, they want to feed the chick that's hungriest first. Uh, the chicks want to eat as much as possible. Um, so this, this is a game called the Sir Philip Sidney game, and uh, Seaman Pudiger and Kevin Zolman uh, did an evolutionary dynamic analysis of the Sir Philip Sidney game, um, and they find a lot of the, a lot, not most, but a significant portion of, uh, of, the, of the state space gets attracted to a face, and you have cycles of the face. So it's like matching pennies on that face. So again, you never get to equilibrium. Well, these things are dynamically um, they can be As it stands with this dynamics, that's the picture. So here's something that's worse. Um, this is not exactly the best picture, uh, but it's, it's close because I couldn't get the best picture. Uh, this is a picture of a strange attractor called the open strange attractor in population ecology. Uh, and this is, this is, this is chaotic. That is, uh, things sort of, there's an unstable equilibrium point. Things get close to it, and then they shoot out, and then they go around, and then they get close to it again. And then they shoot out, but in a way that you really can't predict, right? Get something called a strange attractor. Uh, uh, and uh, Elliot Wagner found that uh, you could get, uh, you know, a signaling game. Uh, with not common interest, but with payoffs that don't look particularly bizarre, um, such that uh, you get attracted to uh, a sub-simplex uh, in which you get chaos and stuff like this, right? You get a straight track. Um, this is in a two-population model, uh, so, uh, so it's Hamiltonian chaos because population dynamics and the two population replicator dynamics uh, is Hamilton. Uh, uh, so this is uh, this is a little more robust than the cycles because the cycles I showed you weren't limit cycles, they're not structurally stable. So you return them a little bit and you get them to spiral in the spiral out. Set up. Maybe you should perturb the dynamics because a lot of the things I've showed you are not structurally stable. And what that means is if you change the dynamics a little bit, they change a little bit. Okay. And I showed you that already uh, with the plane, the pooling equilibria that collapsed to a line. Right? Um, so uh, in two by two by two states unequal. Okay. So you could perturb the dynamics a little more and that line would change depending on whether you may think you go out a little bit or a little bit or whatever. Um, so, so the most reasonable principal perturbation to try is to, uh, in an evolutionary context, uh, is to throw in a little mutation. In the large population model, uh, there's, there's a good mo a model of replicator dynamics with mutation, called replicator mutator dynamics, and things are known about it, uh, that is, conditions for which it must converge and so on. Um, some of them, uh, a 
established by Joseph Hofbauer. Um, and Hudiger and Hofbauer, in this journal theoretical biology paper, um, um, do this. They add uh, a little mutation to the replicator dynamics. And what mutation does is it collapses that line to a single point. Uh, and that single point is now sitting there in the interior of the simplex of population proportions. And the question is, is it an unstable point in which case you get restored the nice conclusion that probability one uh, emergence of a signaling system slightly perturbed by, uh, by mutation? Uh, or is it stable, in which case it attracts some of the space right? and you get the bad result of that? And the answer is it depends. Right? It depends on how unequal the probability of the states are. If they're close to being equal, a little mutation restores probability one emergence of a signal system. But at some point, as they get more and more unequal probability, there's a bifurcation in the dynamics. And that point becomes an attractor. It attracts stuff near it, and then two unstable points on either side of it. Uh, two unstable points yeah, appear on either side of it. Um, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so I could show you that. Um, let the game itself evolve. Uh, I should stop. Okay, so you could let the game itself evolve, but I'll, I'll leave that as a teaser. <laughs> Synonyms persisted as opposed to. Lewis Daring said that. 
first time we did this in our center. And he said, put a little cost on all of the signals, and you'll, you'll find that synonyms will go away. Well, well not on the yeah. active signaling, but on, well, my intuition is not on the active signaling, but on having a capacity to make that. Well, I tried all kinds of stuff that didn't work. I mean, maybe there's something I didn't think of, but it really didn't work. differential costs. I mean, I, the idea was you put uniform costs on, right? And then yeah, that, that would maybe is the for, for right? maintaining something as an active signal, right? So that it's cheaper to have two active signals than three, right? right? Okay. And, and you think, well, dummy, right? But the dynamics doesn't do that. I mean, you, you can put that in and it doesn't work, right? So you need something fancier than that to, to make it. Now there, there's there there are models that you could have with some kind of forgetting, right, or finite population where pipes kind of die out, right? um, and that can prune the number of signals if you have if you have many more signals than you need, and some of them aren't used very frequently, and you've got a finite population. Um, that it can be that the fluctuations just improve the number of signals in the population. Uh, but that's a little delicate because if you have a finite population, you know, like this with guys dying, anything can happen, right? Anything can go extinct. So it's a question of relative probability. A lot of real world um, communication systems, I think in natural languages, but also things like genetic code, have some amount of synonymy in it. And um, I'm wondering if part of the explanation of the maintenance of synonymy has, might have to do with um, what happens when you introduce some noise into it. So has anyone looked at what happens in the Lewis signal in games with some noise so that a, you know, a given signal once sent has a certain probability of turning into another signal before received? Because you, know, from inform you would expect that when we know from information theory that if, if you've got noise, then you better have some redundancy. You know, the most efficient thing will have some redundancy, well, which is in, in essence synonymy because you can be able to. Sure, sure. I, I understand what you're saying. Okay. Uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, stuff done with, with noise, but there are a few problems with noise. Um, but the, the inference. That it would be better, right? Um, to that it's what evolves is not a good inference. Um, yeah, no, so just so you have to have you have to have the the dynamics driving it, and then the, the dynamics doesn't care what's better for these things, right? It just does what it does. Um, so it's what's better for reproduction, what drives the dynamics, and that could drive the species. So I'll, I'll tell you what I, a model that I have um, that I call a Condorcet model. Um, so uh, the, a bunch of senders observe the same state of the world, but they observe it uh, with some independent errors. And they all send signals to a receiver. The receiver now has to decide what to do. And the receiver, uh, this is just driven by, say, reinforcement arm. So these guys, no, the receiver can't. The receiver just gets uh, And uh, what the receiver likes to do then is to, is to take a vote, right? take a short vote, which is the right thing to do. So this, this is, an, and this is noise and observation, but you could put the noise in, noise in sending the signals, and I think it would work the same way. Um, uh, so this is where the dynamics uh, drives you to something that's that's, uh, that's pretty good uh, for the whole group. Uh, but there's no reason to think that that's always true. Any 
signal and the noise associated with it, as you were saying, could there be some way of recognizing some type of patterns that they don't need to identify? What could be the underlying real signal that is coming in? Can that is to isolate the noise? I, I, I had trouble hearing this. <laughs> what I'm asking is, can you identify through pattern recognition if there is a certain associated noise with the actual signal? Um, the, the evolution of pattern recognition, I think, is, is, a, is a, a really important subject. And somewhere it comes in a little higher up in the evolution of signal. Because that's when you want to, um, when, you, when you want to look at patterns of signals. And I think that's probably how you're going to have to ex explain um, more complicated signals, the origin of more complicated signals, and you begin to recognize patterns, uh, and, and, and that gives you compositionality of signals. Okay. But that's, you know, I have some very tentative things to say about that, but uh, uh, that, that is a very well developed Bill? I have to, uh, first, the first thing I'd like you to do is to Show us what you were doing with Sandy Zabel. And then I'll have a question. That's what I'm doing. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, so, this is an idea to let the game itself evolve. Um, and especially since uh, you can get into nasty trouble if you don't have enough signals, uh, why not invent new signals? Uh, and uh, this happens all the time, I think, in nature. And yeah. So, of course, you want to study this, but you need some sort of practical model. Um, and uh, the idea is to modify reinforcement learning to reinforcement with the dimension. Um, and uh, the, uh, we have a, an earned model of reinforcement learning. Right. So, um, so this is your adding in the extra balls proportional to how much better the Yeah, yeah, that's the, that's, the, that's the model. It's a model of reinforcement learning. Actually, it's kind of a model of finite population evolution, too. Uh, uh, now, if you want to put something, uh, if you want to invent something new, uh, there's an ERD model that was studied by a man named Poppy as a model for evolution, neutral evolution. We have lots of alleles that don't make it here. Um, and what he had was a polyurn with an extra ball in it. The polyurn has colored balls in it, there's a black ball in it. The black ball is a mutator. You reach in, if you get the black ball, you put it back and you find a ball of an entirely different color that isn't in here. You put it in. And there's a potential infinity of different colors out there, so you can always do this. So this is Hoppy's urn. Now Hoppy's urn doesn't have reinforcement, but you can add reinforcement. Put it together with the raw data. Okay. Now we have a model of reinforcement convention. Um, we can make this into a model in signaling. Um, that is, we equip everybody with, uh, we equip the senders with Hoppy urn. Uh, if they reach in and get the mutator ball, uh, they find a new signal, they try it out, right? If the sender either does the right thing or not. If the sender doesn't do the right thing, the new, the new, the new signal is discarded, right? It's not considered as a potential signal anymore. But if the receiver does the right thing, uh, then the sender consider, considers it a signal in each of the sensors are potential signal, right? The receiver's got an urn that is an urn for this signal, right? It's a potential signal. And that's how the process goes. Um, so we know some things. Um, the limiting number of signals in this urn model is infinite, which is also a model for the single operator that you have 
uh, an infinite number of signals in public um, um, probability. But the number of signals grows slowly. It grows slowly. Again. So you can run the thing for 10,000 or 100,000 trials and end up with maybe 20, 50 signals, 20 signals, not a crazy number of signals. Um, if you, I have another slide that says this. Uh, oh, yes, there. Players always learn the same. You said not reading the part about it all being simulations. But, I mean, all of these pooling traps, yeah, parts, so this pooling traps, all, all these cases you were looking at, yes, for example, yeah. chaos one yeah. we have all yeah, this yeah. So just add players this invent their way out of all the traps and learn to see. Right. So it'd be nice to have an analysis that, yeah, that huh? but that's that's down the road somewhere. Do you have any? I mean. Uh, Any idea about why this this modification should make sense? Yeah. So this is this is like okay, this is like adding. There's two, there are two ideas. There's Wayne's idea. You can fall in a trap, and the new signal will let you get out. Okay. And the other is you'll invent enough signals so you'll never get into a trap. There are two possibilities, or they could both be true. You can test them both by simulation. Yeah. You test Wayne's idea by putting you in a trap, yeah. right, uh -huh. and seeing if you can invent your way out. You test the other one by giving a lot of signals to start with and see if you ever get into a trap. And so what of course, happens? theoretically you will, but it could be with very, very small probability. And, and, and have you done, what, what happens? When you both are true. Both, okay. both are true. You have enough signals, you, you, if you have very small probability of getting into a trap. If you're in a trap and you can invent new signals, now, my, my actual, this ha, has helped the answer already in a certain way, but I'm still wondering. My question was maybe on the two basic kinds of dynamics. Uh, now, one of the things was happening in these finite cases, you were saying, look, the, the learning one is really like a finite version of the replicator. But I want to ask you about how informative the two kinds of dynamics would be these various cases, and, and, uh, and one of the things that you're saying, like most in mean, this last thing, is for these small number cases, they're sort of very similar anyway. Or, well, okay, we'll let you say that. Yeah, they're very similar in some sense. That is, if you have, say, a fixed problem, fixed decision problem, like a bandwidth problem, yeah. like you're playing yeah. two slot machines, you know more abandoned problem, um, then, um, then you can prove that Roth, you can prove, somebody proved, a guy named Beggs proved uh, that Roth error of reinforcement learning converges to playing the better paying <coughs> slot machine 100% of the time. Okay. Uh, to prove this, he used stochastic approximation. The idea is that as this stuff piles up in the earth, right, the, the process slows down. Right, and it gets, with high higher and higher probability, it approximates closer and closer to the blue field dynamics. You can calculate the mean field dynamics. And the mean field dynamics is kind of replicated. So that's how we prove it. And the stuff that with P mantle and so on, our, our theorem is proved uh, uh, using mean field dynamics. And if you look at the mean field dynamics and the way that this is set up, it's set up with some, some tricks and everything to get it into a forceful place. Um, there's a pooling surface, right? And the mean field dynamics on one side of the pooling surface goes to one signaling system and on the other goes to the other signaling system. But then there's some, because it's probabilistic, and then the thing you have to worry about, uh, like whether it can be broken. How many, you can't cross the surface, and it's been a number of times that has to be proved, and then there's a question of what happens at the boundary, and can it converge to the surface at the boundary, and the usual, the off the shelf theorems don't apply at the boundary, because there's no variance, and so on. So it, turn, it turns out to me, 
complicated, but that's, I mean, that's basically what's driving it. Now, of course, you could have, I mean, you might say, but I'm interested in people who are smarter, right? Um, uh, so if you want to design an algorithm that will always learn to sit in all single games, um, it isn't hard, right? But that's a different thing. Want to say here, here are people, animals, whatever. They're dumb reinforcement learners. They the say, well, that's one question. Uh, the engineering question is, well, can I design an algorithm that all this learning is um, Well, here's one. Um, if in these signaling games, um, these signaling games either pay off or not. Right? The basic rules of games mess with the payoff function. It's a different story, but the basic ones, you either win or lose. Uh, so your algorithm could be, if you win, you keep doing what you did last time. If you lose, you try something at random. Okay. Players do that, they always learn how to So it isn't, it isn't hard, but, but you'd like to know how these natural dynamics In natural languages, you know, single word or single signal can have more than one meaning, depending on the context. A completely different, unrelated meaning, depending on the context. Is, is there a way of, has that been taken into account in terms of similar Simulations of the kind that you've been studying? Nothing like that, is it? Yeah. Because that would require both sender and receiver to have some knowledge of the state of the world, and then, but yet some further aspect of the state would yeah, have to yeah. be sort of communicated yeah. in the game. And yeah. And they're just not. So I don't see why you couldn't modify right. the basic games in, to take account of this, but. Uh, uh, None, none of the stuff that I know about is not this. Yeah, I was wondering whether that's a, a sort of functionally equivalent way of inventing new signals, giving old signals new meanings in some sense. Well, I don't know. I mean, certainly, depends how you set up your context. I mean, In principle, it certainly seems right that if you can give a signal more than one meaning, depending on the context, then you can do more with a small number of signals. Uh, but then there's a modeling question of how do you actually get this model and what's its relation to the other models. Interesting question. Brad? So what's the significance of the burning model? <laughs> 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 so, so, um, so this is this is a question about about how things would go if you made um, your learners a little bit smarter, a little bit different. So, 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 as I understood the, the explanation of the reinforcement learning, what happens is uh, uh, in the event. I get a payoff, I add the number, number of balls equal to the payoff, right? Which is kind of a, a straight rule, sort of, you might say, right? You could imagine agents having different um, attitudes toward sort of inductive risk, you might say, right? So that, you know, you might sort of slow down the learning process by adding sort of fewer balls with the success, or you might have a, have a kind of case where you'd add, 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 add sort of a large number of balls faster in fact and, and I'm curious if you think that that would make any real good difference to these results if you had had uh, um, uh, the signalers sort of with different um, uh, who, who who are um, so, so disposed to um, learn inductively at different rates some fast because I'm, I'm taking it sort of the more balls I put in the more sort of 
So, so, so that slows said, you down. Yeah. But you want to know what happens if you don't slow down, perhaps. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I guess I'm, 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 I'm just sort of curious if there's going to be sort of difference here with respect to the question of whether or not you end up fully in equilibrium or not. Um, so I can say a couple of things because a couple of things are relevant. One is um, some form, so this this form of reinforcement learning slows down, right? um, and really the stochastic process sort of fluctuates around some mean field equation, and there's a term that slows down um, uh, uh, in proportion to how far out you are, proportion roughly in proportion to time. That is why. Um, uh, there are other forms of reinforcement like the bush mosteller the plain vanilla bush mosteller model that doesn't slow down at all. Um, and um, those guys learn too fast in the sense that they can grab onto something that's suboptimal and do it forever. Um, so in the two-armed demanded problem. Push Mostello learners have a <coughs> positive probability of playing the inferior slot machine for um, And the same carries over into these evolutionary, I, I mean, into these uh, game theory models uh, that you can, you can lock on to things that are in the national area. I mean, all sorts of things are possible. They don't not happen very often. Now, I did run simulations with basic push Mosteller and um, with reasonable parameters. Um, it, learns for, it learns the signal pretty well, but it, but it, it won't always. Um, so that's part of the answer, and that's in how, in the, in the step size of the stochastic process. Um, the other part of the answer uh, is um, what about the initial problem? So I make the initial probabilities, I put 2,000 balls in the turn, right? That the reinforcements are one, right? Then you're going to learn very slowly, at least in the beginning, your, your priors are going to be very, very heavy. But if I put in one one hundredth of a ball uh, uh, in the area, right, then, or, or reinforce, multiply reinforcements right. by a hundred times, uh, then the prior stuff is going to be swamped out. Um, now it turns out um, Roth and Arab in their experiments of using this stuff to learn in zero sum games looked at a wide variety of prior weights and found they didn't make any difference. But it turns out that in signaling games they do. Uh, and very small prior weights are very good for the learning of the signal. It turns out. We have very small prior weights then um, individuals tend to lock on to successful pieces of the system. Well, let's thank our final Arsenal one more time.